Uh, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here, uh, here in the virtual world. Um, it's it's my favorite thing in the world to come talk about teaching, specifically feedback. I am a weird human being that likes to talk about feedback. Uh, hopefully at the end of the session, uh, I know I'll put my objectives up, but that you all have a new a new lens on feedback and the role we all play in it. Uh, and and hopefully get over a little hump about uh, maybe any, any stress you have about feedback. So uh, I have no disclosures, uh, except for that I'm a complete geek about this kind of thing. Um, and sadly, I've been teaching about feedback for 20 plus years, and I still have to teach about it. So I guess I'm failing miserably at it, but that's okay. I think we make some headway here and there. Um, here are my objectives. Honestly, we're going to do a lot in this session, hopefully. And really, if if um, I hit these and several others, we're doing well. Uh, but hopefully, it's really the objectives or whatever you get out of it. Um, so here's the overview of what we'll do today. We'll talk about what feedback is. We'll talk about what the culture of feedback is and should be. And then we're going to use a coaching framework to work through it. A coaching framework is not going to address only feedback, but feedback will be a big piece of it. And then in there, we'll discuss some feedback models and uh, and talk about our role in feedback. So I'd love in a chat or just verbally or however you want to do it, when I say the word feedback, what is your initial reaction to that? I'm going to try and get my uh, chat to work. Someone said, oh, boy. Oh, boy. What else do you have? There we go. I've got it. Challenging. Yeah, exactly. Anything else? Someone said, keep reading. That's a... <laughs> keep re read more. Is that what I'm getting? The, the uh -huh. classic read more? Sandwich the, sandwich the bad with the good. Great. We'll talk about the sandwich as well. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, right? The initial reaction, the first two were, oh boy, and challenging, right? That this was at least some negative or some tension about it. Um, it it's like when somebody says, we need to talk, or when uh, in my high school day, someone says, you need to go to the principal. Um, those are never, you never have a good reaction to that, right? You assume something. I still get, if I get a call from my boss's assistant saying, the chair wants to meet with you. It's like, oh gosh, you know, and it, it, it's rarely that, but we tend to have this view of feedback that something's coming, we're not really sure. Um, but the reality is feedback can be, should be thought of in a different way, right? It should be thought of as an opportunity. It should be thought of as like, oh, awesome, I'm getting feedback. That's great, which I don't think very many of you think about that. Uh, but feedback really is just a way to get from point A to point B. It's a way to see where we are as a performer now, whatever that performance is, if that's taking a history, if that's talking to families, if that's giving a lecture, whatever it is, here's where we are. Here's where I want to be, whatever that is. And in, in, uh, we'll talk about it in uh, training, but that's competency-based, whatever that element is. And here's where you wanna go. And here, then there should be a piece of here's how we get there. That's all feedback is. It's not a judgment. It's not a statement. It's not a finger wag. It's it's just, hey, here's where you are. Here's where you want to be. Now let's figure out a way to get there, um, which has a different, should have a different reaction than, oh boy, right? That should have a different reaction that, that your heart rate goes up 15 to 20 points just by hearing the word. And in competency-based education, it's the hallmark, right? So this is a quote for, about competency-based education, and that's where we are now with uh, residency education. Uh, it's the optimal combination of regular formative feedback and learning opportunities to practice skills and improve performance. So think about that, right? It's an optimal combination. So it's regular formative, where I think a lot of times we just think of summative. So quick difference on that. Formative feedback is often verbal. It's me saying to somebody, hey, you know, I saw you do this. I really liked how you did that. I might change this one thing, right? Versus they got an honors or I'm going to give them a three on the milestone. That's summative. The first one's formative. So what it's saying is give a lot of that small, quick feedback saying, or not even small and quick, but sometimes here's where you are. Let's think about what you can do next. Um, and then give the opportunities for them to practice, right? If I were to give somebody feedback on doing a procedure and then I didn't let them do the procedure, that would be a problem. But the whole goal is to improve performance, to get better. 
Um, I always think it's fun if you ask learners, whether those are students or residents or fellows, you know, how many of you don't want to be the best doctor you can be? I ask that every time I go on service. I've never had a hand raised, right? So horrible double negative, but the point is made. Everybody wants to be better at what they do. A few of our learners don't think they have far to go, but most people want to get better. And that's what this is. It's just a way to get you there. If any of you have done a lot of other different types of things outside of medicine, we do this all the time. Um, but the culture matters. What we set up, how we establish the world of feedback truly matters. And uh, I'm a sports fan. Uh, my husband's an Indiana Hoosier, so we'll talk about the gentleman on the right. These are two largely different cultures. So I don't know if anybody in the audience uh, knows who these two people are. But on the left is John Wooden. John Wooden is the quintessential example of a coach. If you look at college sports, he was at UCLA. He's revered. He's written books on coaching. People write about him and what he did. The gentleman he's standing next to is someone named Lou Alcindor. You might know him as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, one of the greats to play for the Lakers. Um, but he was, every time you hear about John Wooden, you think this is a man who raised men, right? He didn't just coach basketball. He made them better people. The gentleman on the right uh, is an Indiana Hoosier. This is Bobby Knight, who uh, I just convinced my husband is not the perfect man. Uh, he won championships, so people loved him. But this is a classic look on Bobby Knight. Bobby Knight would yell at the refs. He threw a chair on the court. Um, he would swear at his players. Some of his players will swear by it and have it ex say the ex you know experience was you accept it because you got better. But honestly, that's not what we should have. This is a memory I have of when I was a learner. And I don't know how many of you have been in practice 20 plus years, but I believe in the old days, we had far more people who would just yell at you or snap at you. Um, and maybe their delivery wasn't exactly conducive to growth. We would like to be the left side and we'd like to avoid being the right side. So how do we do that, right? How do we build a culture that is supportive and that is really helpful to develop professionally? So that goes back to my, I think my favorite study I've ever read in, in my professional career. And this was in 2014 and it was Watling and his colleagues. And what they did is they took actually people in medicine. So they were medical students, residents, recent graduates, so anywhere along the spectrum who had had successful careers in sports or music. Now, this was not me playing basketball up through ninth grade and playing piano till I was 10. This is, these are D, D1 athletes. They were Olympians in the group. And the musicians were like concert level pianists and violinists. These are people who like could have gone on to Juilliard and really had significant careers. And they, they did a survey or interviews and they asked them about feedback. Feedback in medicine, versus feedback in music or sports, whichever they were in. And they tried to figure out, are they the same? Are there differences in that, in, in feedback? Well, if you, if you read the article, what was interesting is this. There were three influencers of feedback, two of which were exactly the same across the two areas. We'll call them two, medicine and sports or music. The learner had an influence, right? So was the learner receptive? What was the learner looking to do? The characteristics of the feedback, which we will touch on, were same across. They had to be specific. They had to be you know, um, behavioral. They had to be all timely. But the culture differed between sports and music and medicine. And that was a huge difference when talking to these individuals about how they viewed feedback in their other career, so to speak, their other life versus us. And there were, uh, there's a long list. And you should read the article because it's fantastic. But a couple of things that stood out, one was that the expectations of feedback were different. Um, and I like this quote, you expect your coach to criticize everything you do, because if they're not, then that means they weren't watching. So there's this free range to just say, well, you didn't do that, right? You need to do this more. Whereas I find that in medicine, people are less willing to give a step-by-step -step critique because it's less expected. So there's this expectation and we sit and we say, give feedback all the time, but I don't think that takes, right? Oh, I know I have to give feedback. Somebody told me to give my feedback. So I'm going to do a checkbox. And I have a colleague who every time he does feedback, will pull the, all the students together and say, you're doing great. I mean, that is not somebody who's sitting there wanting to say something because I think a lot of us feel like, well, I don't want to upset them. I, I don't know that it's my place. And honestly, we aren't trained as teachers. Most of us, most of us become teachers because we happen to do medicine. And so that expectation of really not just that we should do it, 
but how we should do it isn't there, where a coach has been trained to do that. So that's one of the differences. Um, this is directing the attention of learners and teachers to performance. So sometimes we get away from performance. Now, I think when you're doing simulation or you're doing procedures, it's a little bit easier to focus on performance because there is like a tactile performance that's happening in there. But a lot of times it's just how you're thinking about a patient or how you're interacting with a patient, which is a little different. So in this one, the common goal of your teacher and yourself is, of course, just to make the best music you can, which is a really noble thing. It was always for me really hard to be offended, truly offended by comments and music. So that's the idea that when we sit there, I know that you're trying to make my piano better. My favorite piano teacher when I was a third grader, that's all she wanted to do was help me play that song better. The Tide is High by Blondie. That's all I wanted. If you're old enough, you can imagine that as a piano song for a third grader. Um, I want to just get it right. Right. And so that was the focus on this. This is that we don't necessarily focus on performance. Right. We're not I'm I'm focused on making sure the patient I'm a hospitalist. So I'm focused on making sure we have the right plan for the patient. I'm focused on making sure the nurse is listening, has gotten what she needs out of it. I'm focused on a lot of things. So I may not be as focused on performance. And so what I give is maybe not seen that way by learners. And then learner emotion. I think all of us have this. Um, it was hard for me to get criticism during med school and residency. Sports, I didn't mind. Maybe I expected them to criticize me. But maybe that was the mindset. And so there is a difference, right? We have a group of type A students who always done well. And we were those students. And so now they come in and I've got to tell them something that's not, you got a question right or wrong. That's more concrete, right? Oh, you got that question wrong. This is not that. Now there's a lot more emotion. We saw it when I said, what does feedback mean to you? There's like, oh boy, right? Um, it feels more of a judgment, but when you hire a coach, you don't think that I'm paying them. Like, I'm not gonna be upset if he tells me or he or she tells me something. So that emotional piece gets in the way. There are a lot of other things. I don't wanna dwell too much on it, but if you have the chance, go check out the article because it's really, really fascinating. Um, and so we have two different cultures, right? When we think about it, we're really looking at a, a, a culture that's learning oriented. That's people who get coached. We're here to grow, right? I hired a coach because I want to get better. My, um, I encourage critical thinking and encourages critical thinking, self-directed learning. I'm going to try and get better. I want to think about what I'm doing, right? I don't want to just perform and then hope. And this happens, right? I just, uh, a learner will perform, present on rounds and just hope I get it right. It's really not learning oriented, they embrace uncertainty, um, reasoning's right, not necessarily the right answer, and you're going to have detailed feedback. Whereas the performance-oriented model, which is a little bit more some of the examples, okay, I want you to be competent. I want you to appear competent. Uh, don't show any uncertainty. Um, you know, fake it till you make it. Um, and then we're going to try and avoid feedback because it's going to have negative consequences. I don't want to, like, get a bad grade. I don't want to get a bad evaluation. Um the question for I have for you of which of these cultures do we, we traditionally reward in medicine? Do we reward learning oriented or do we reward performance oriented? And you can say it or throw it in the chat. Oh, I know you guys got this. Oh. Yeah, so, <laughs> performance, right? This is when I describe it, it's perfect, right? How many of you like didn't want to look bad in your medical school years or didn't want to look like you didn't know, right? We, and it, it starts in high, it starts in college, right? We reward the people who are the smartest. We, I mean, I'm at University of Chicago, top 20 medical school. Like we want, we tell them all the time. I don't, but other people do that. They're the best in the, in the, the nation. So if you keep telling someone they're the best in the nation, they want to perform for you. Um, and so we really don't emphasize the learning aspect. Um, this is not dissimilar from growth mindset. Carol Dweck, and I have no, uh, no kickbacks on this, but if you haven't read her book, it's a pithy book, but it's fantastic. You can get through it in like a day. Um, and she talked about fixed mindset and growth mindset. Now what Carol Dweck talked about, it's overused now in medical education and people are using it the wrong way. Um, but fixed mindset, everyone has fixed their growth. You can be fixed or growth at the age of five. She's found it in, in like kindergartners. And you're not fixed or growth for everything. You can be growth mindset for one area, fixed for another. But fixed, much like performance uh, culture, is you are smart or you aren't. You can do it or you can't. So you're going to avoid anything that makes you look like you can't do it. You're going to give up easily because uh, I just, I don't know, I can't really ride a bike, right? Um, it's not worth trying because it's innately you. 
Um, I am fixed mindset. And I will I keep saying this when I talk about fixed and growth mindset, but I'm fixed mindset with art. My brother's very talented. Um, and my daughter's very talented. And I will tell you, I, I can't draw a stick figure. I will say that repeatedly. Um, what's interesting is it's not true. I went to an art class with my daughter and she picked, uh, we were looking for an art teacher. And so the woman gave us a class. She said, pick something on the internet you want to paint. And my daughter picked this horrifically difficult um, forest scene. And I thought this is going to be comical. I called my brother. I said, it's going to be so bad. You're going to have to hang it in your house. And we went and we spent like an hour and a half. And I don't, I mean, I don't paint at all. And at the end, honestly, it was good. Like, okay, the teacher had to help me about 30%. But I had this fixed mindset. I told everybody going into it, it's going to be ugly. I can't paint. And then I came away with something going, huh, that's really interesting. I bet if I kept going, I could be better. And so growth mindset is that opposite that, you know, hey, it's a challenge. I'm not good at it, but I'm going to learn it. I'm going to keep going, even if it's difficult, because I'm going to push through it. Um, it's all about effort to get to mastery. And I like criticism and feedback because it's going to help me get there. So we really want to get people to be growth mindset. It's a huge piece of what we do, right? Uh, we need to move away from letting them peop people think they're fixed. Oh, I just can't do that. Or to let them think, I am just naturally good. You can't let people think that either because they're not going to grow. Oh, I'm just, I'm good at it, right? How many people have said, oh, uh, you're really good at math, right? This is why we tell people to uh, to praise the process, not the, not the outcome when kids are young. Oh, I love that you work so hard on that. That's great. Rather than saying, you're such a smart little kid. Um, we can do the same in medical education. In medicine though, so to take it away from growth mindset and Watling's uh, piece about uh, music and sports, it's different, right? We find our feedback lacks clear expectations. Um, we don't know how much uh, like I'm supposed to get. I don't know as a attending how much I'm supposed to give. What's my role in feedback? Um, it doesn't facilitate honest feedback. I think partly because we work with each other so much. So I don't want to upset you if I have to work with you again. Plus there's the whole worry about repercussions on my evaluation if I say something to you. It's not bi-directional. Now this is where we deviate slightly from the coaching frame that we're going to talk about, because I don't think we often like immediately give coaches feedback as well, but you should be able to give feedback on their coaching. Um, the relationship affects the credibility. So it's interesting if I, as a silly example, if I give a student um, or a learner feedback that they, um, they swear too much, someone might look at me and go, you swear girl. And so that affects the credibility. If somebody tells me like, I need better patient-centered communication and I've watched them, I don't think they have good patient-centered communication. That credibility can affect what you're getting at. But also the receptivity of the learner can affect it. But everywhere in medicine agrees we need it for professional growth. There is no way to get better without feedback. And so we have these problems, but we can create a culture that affects the first four um, and that will ensure the fifth. So how do we do that? Well, we all, and I don't know if we have any trainees in the room right now, but we all have responsibility, both as a player and as a coach. So we can think about the players right now as our residents, as our students, as our fellows. But I'm going to say for a second, I'm a player too. Um, I'm always learning. I'm always trying to be better. Um, and so we can put ourselves in that frame a little bit, but let's think about it first from the traditional learner frame. What is their job in this? Well, I always have to put uh, one of my favorite players because I'm in Chicago um, and I uh, sometimes will change this out. I guess I could put someone from Tennessee, but I don't really know a lot of Tennessee basketball players. Sorry. Um, I'll never put LeBron James here. We can start that fight later. Just mark it down. You can put it in the chat if you disagree. Um, but what is our job, right? Inform self-assessment for players, solicitation and utilization, how to do that, and then upward feedback, which we'll talk about. Let's start with the model, we actually, um, we'll talk about informed self-assessment with a model in a second, but let's talk about solicitation and utilization because that involves it. So a friend of mine came up to me years ago and said, I know you teach about giving feedback, but do you teach anything about getting feedback, how to get feedback? And I was like, oh, wow, no, mind blown. So we actually did a study where we went and interviewed, uh, we did focus groups at three sites with um, uh, physicians, uh, attendings in all the specialties, um, residents in multiple specialties and students. And we asked basically, what's the best process for a learner to get feedback from the learner side? And so the first thing was reflecting on performance. So that's that first step. And we'll talk about it differently in a second. But what our study showed is like, you have to be able to sit there as a learner 
and identify what are your strengths and weaknesses. You can't go into feedback going, do you have feedback for me? With no pre-thought. Now this, this is the same for me. If I go ask somebody for feedback, I have to know what I think of my performance. And all too often, we just passively go into a feedback session. Um, we use individualized learning plans in pediatrics, um, and uh, we're used to, at least in our residency. And so that could be looking down and saying, you know, what are my goals and did I achieve those? So you need to reflect on that before you go in to get feedback. Now, I would say part of our job, and we'll talk about this, is how do we facilitate that? Then you have to solicit it. And a lot of times attendings aren't going to give feedback. So we, the learner, have to prompt it. We have to ask. So that's about timing. You know, I love it when a learner chases me to the elevator when I just want to go to the bathroom. It's like, can I have feedback now? And I'm like, I need to go to the bathroom. Um, maybe that's saying, can we, can we do feedback at the end of the day? Can we have it at the end of the week? Be purposeful with what you've just reflected, right? Now be purposeful of what you're asking for. Don't say, what, do you, what feedback do you have for me? Well, on what, right? Are there things you're particularly working on? Like, what were you trying to improve? And just be very open-minded because a lot of times our learners like feedback for confirmation of their excellence. That's that fixed mindset. Rather than going in and saying, I really want it. Someone mentioned the feedback sandwich, which in the old days was tell them something positive, tell them something negative, tell them something positive. As a learner, I always liked what I called an open face sandwich. I didn't want that first piece of bread. Just hit me, go straight into the stuff you want to improve. I think over the years I've become paleo and I just really want the meat, right? Because the rest, I don't care, but we do need to reinforce open attitude and not just look for the pieces of bread. Um, obviously making sure people observe you, preparing some specific questions and emailing people to ask for it. Those are all some things we came up. But over the years, this has been actually developed into uh, Bill Couture and colleagues built the Master Adaptive Learner. If you don't know it, it's one of my favorite things. Um, and the Master Adaptive Learner, honestly, is just a hodgepodge of other theories that they shoved into this wonderful graphic. And Bill will admit that. Uh, it has growth mindset. It has deliberative practice. It has self-determination theory. But the idea is that anyone who's a Master Adaptive Learner, and that includes us, is someone who can plan by identifying a gap. Where's my problem? What am I missing? Maybe someone gave me an evaluation. Maybe someone gave me feedback. Maybe I just noticed I'm not doing that as well, right? Um, and then says, I need to get better at that. So I'm going to look for resources. Maybe I'm going to go to a review session. Maybe I'm going to go take a course. Maybe I'm going to talk to a colleague. Then they engage in learning around that deficit. Um, and once they decide what they're going to do, they will go and try it out. Okay. Okay. So now I've, I've taken a course on how to give a lecture, and now I'm going to go try all those techniques in a lecture. And, I'm going to and then I'm going to decide if it worked. If it worked, I'm going to incorporate it into my practice. If it works some, I'll incorporate some, but now I'm going to go back through the process. A master adaptive learner is always reflecting, is always thinking about how do I, I mean, they're not waiting for someone to tell them what to improve. They're always in that mindset. And so we need to raise master adaptive learners, but that is that is the responsibility of the learner to be active and thoughtful and always thinking about how they want to contribute to their own success, but kind of coaching themselves a little bit. And then there's upward feedback. Um, we talked about this being bi-directional and it needs to be bi-directional. We have to be able to give feedback to those above us. I know I could have a whole session where everybody told me a scenario where, well, I have to talk to my chairman or I have to tell somebody who's mean or whatever it is. But I think most comers, like 90% of the people you work with are going to be amenable to this. And so we as teachers are constantly learning to be better, whether that's as a teacher, whether that's as a team leader, whether that's whatever it is. I mean, I find that my students are phenomenal because of their different generation of reminding me about diversity, equity, inclusion items, about implicit bias, about language use. Um, and you want them to be able to tell you that. We actually did a study recently that we published where we interviewed pediatric hospitalists and uh, we actually surveyed pediatric hospitals about would you accept feedback from students and residents? And we gave them four classic areas that an attending would have. So um, teaching, leadership, interpersonal communication, so personal, and then clinical care. And we said, would you accept feedback or do you want, how much would you value feedback? And it turns out they value feedback from students and residents in all of those. Clinical was a little bit lower from students because it's kind of like, what do you know? Uh, but residents they wanted, certainly in, per, in uh, the personal qualities, they want feedback. And then when you ask them, do they get enough feedback from their learners? The answer is no. So the reality is uh, most of us, if you're a learner sitting in the audience, want this right? It's, it's how we do it. 
you know, how it's approached, but part of it we'll talk about our approach is inviting it. Um, so something to think about as a learner is giving your, uh, the people who teach you feedback, but the data is there. We also have done, um, we're working on final edits on a paper where we interviewed learners about how, um, how attendees could help facilitate this. Um, so now let's get to most of you are faculty. So we'll talk about the coaches role. So Phil Jackson, the, uh, the coach that got six championships. Um, and so let's talk about that. So what does it take to be a coach? I love this definition. Being a coach requires the provision of contemporaneous and individualized feedback on observed behavior and the use of stimulating and challenging observations to maximize the coachee's potential. All right, so we saw feedback in there, but let's break down some of these words. Contemporaneous. All too often our feedback is not, right? We can say it's contemporaneous because we gave it at the end of the week, but now it's been a week and they haven't gotten to fix everything. I'll tell you in the old days, 10 years ago, the, all my learners, all my residents and students were like ecstatic if they got feedback at the end of the week. Like, oh my gosh, like I don't get feedback anywhere, anywhere from anyone, but I get it at the end of the week with you. That's fantastic. Now, all they want it every day. They want to know like if there's something small I can fix right now. I want it now. I don't want to keep making the mistake for four days until you tell me on Friday. So it's that idea of like not huge, heavy feedback. And we'll talk about that, but we can give contemporaneous feedback. Don't wait for evaluations. That's summative. That's going to get to them in six months or whenever it gets to them. Tell them now. It should be individualized. So it shouldn't be my colleagues saying you're all doing great. Um, and something you observed. So the reality is uh, we don't see everything our learners do, right? Depending on what your setting is, inpatient, outpatient, emergency room, you may not. So really either only comment on the things you've seen or if they want feedback, if the learner wants feedback, go make sure you observe that, Right. Take a different approach and say, oh, you really want to get a better X? I'll go watch you do it. But then it's important because it's stimulating and challenging observations. We're not there to tell them they're great. We're to push. That's a coach's job. And that goes antithetical to that emotional modulation piece where we're nervous about giving anybody feedback. This doesn't mean be mean. This doesn't mean yell. But it says, let's push them a little bit. Let's just not take that good is good enough. Um, but it's all there to maximize their potential. And I think, again, if we if we use that lens, they're going to take it much better. So quick question for all of you, and you put it in the chat. Is there anyone who's been a phenomenal coach for you in your medical education journey, in your training? You don't have to tell me their name, but you can unmute and just uh, say what made them a great coach for you. Or you can put it in the chat. It's a tough morning, you know. I'm, I'm going to repeat it, but this is really yes, what they said. They said that Dr. Jane is really good at receiving feedback. Oh, re okay. So what what do you mean by that? Like, can you expand on really good at get, getting feedback? <laughs> <laughs> So I heard, get your goals at the beginning of the week and then checks in at the end to make sure you achieve them. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, that's great. That's a great coach, right? And we're going to talk about that model, but it says, what do you want to try and do? And now I'm going to, I'm not just going to ask, I'm going to follow up and see if we made it there. That's awesome. Anybody else have a good coach? I was like, no, sadly, no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think if you think, and probably it's a tough morning, but there are a lot of people who have you coached you well, um, or you've had a coach outside of it. I, uh, my son and I took up archery a year ago. Don't ask. Um, and we have a coach who happens to be like, like national world champion type person. And uh, it's fascinating because I haven't been coached in years, right? I Not since that great, you know, ninth grade basketball season. Um, and it's so fascinating. Same thing. We actually had to sit down in archery, which I'd like to shoot. That's why I'm in it. And they end up, and we had to sit down and write goals, literally write down. And she, every couple of weeks is like, what were your goals? And I'm like, Arr. but she asked the goals so that she can say, how are you advancing? And then part of the goals, we always talk about their, um, uh, their uh, outcome goals. Right. So there's this idea, there's um there's performance goals where like I want to win. 
some con- to- tournament. That's not my power. Like I can do my best, but I was still, I always tell this story of my, co- my best friend. He set a state record in the 50 meter breaststroke in high school um, at the state meet, set a state record. And he lost the meet because the other guy said it more, which is like crazy. So if you have your performances to win, right, that's not in your goal. But if his performance was to break the state record, he did it. He just didn't win. Right. So you have performance goals, you have outcome goals um, and process goals. And so a lot of times what we're helping people on our process goals, like how to get there. And those sound like process goals. I want to get better at this thing. So long term. So let's talk about that because you hit on a couple different things. So this is a coaching framework we just kind of put together from the literature, which is it's got six steps. We're going to go over each um, and we'll go from there. So the first is to identify yourself as a coach. You don't have to say you're a coach. I do. I started probably six years ago before the pandemic, starting my service week by saying, I want you to think of me as your coach. My whole job is just to get you one inch closer to being the best doctor you want to be. Um, How I'm going to do that is I'm going to ask you to set some goals um, and I'm going to help you achieve them. But let's make them realistic, right? Smart goals. Um, And so, or you don't have to say coach. You can say, listen, my job is just to help you get better. I'm not here to judge or assign a score. I tell the students, I know I have to grade you, but if you just focus on your goals, it'll come out in the wash. Um, so redirect what you're there to do as not grade somebody, but you're there to help people get where they want to be. And those goals need to be eye smart. I think most of us know this, but they should be important, important for peds. They should be specific, not learn peds, right? Um, cause I haven't learned peds. Uh, so by the end of the week, I want to be able to like, um, create a differential for the three most common uh, presentations in pediatrics or something. Um, that's specific. I could find, I could figure out if you, what are the three most common? What's a differential should be measurable. That's that piece. I can tell if you did it achievable, right? I want to be able to um, treat every diagnosis in pediatric or inpatient. Well, that's not achievable in a week. Congratulations. Relevant to the rotation, if someone comes on pediatric hospital medicine and says their goal is to be able to take a full developmental history on every patient, I'm like, no, please don't. Dear God, please don't. We don't have time for that. Um, And they're timed, meaning we know how long you have to do it. So after we identify ourselves as a coach and help them create goals, and I should go back. This is exactly what you said, what your coach did. There are a couple different ways to do this. I do it one-on-one. I say, I want everybody to text me or email me their goals by the end of the day one. Two of them. I said, thing one, thing two. I just want two. Don't go crazy. I'll give them feedback if I don't think they're written well. And then I make a document that I keep on my phone and I write theirs down so I can look at them. And I'm always looking at them. Um, We actually have a process at our institution. I was just looking at the paper last night where we actually send an email to all the learners right before they go on their inpatient rotations that says, what are your goals for this week? Once they fill it out, it kicks to their attending. So I actually get it now. Like, virtually. And so I can see that that doesn't go to the students. It just goes to the residents, but it really puts a culture of the program is expecting this to be part of what you do. Um, so you could do it that way. Some people will put up, up on like a canvas or an LMS, whatever you use so that, or med hub. So everybody can put theirs and there can be a back and forth. Uh, some years I've actually put that sheet, a printed copy in the conference room, the workroom, So everybody can see everybody's goals. But I think it needs to be tangible. They need to be able to say them to you and you have a chance to see it. Um, I should say also, I put my goals here. At the beginning of every week of service, I tell my thing one, thing two. I say, here are the two things I'm working on. That's how I, as a coach, start prompting people to give me feedback because I'm letting them know I'm working on something. All right, then you want to make sure you watch them. Again, if they give you a goal that is something you don't watch, don't accept it as a goal. Say, well, I actually don't see you do that. Um, I had someone two weeks ago give me two things that I would never be in the room to see. And I was like, listen, these are great. I'm going to let your senior resident know. We're going to ask them to look at them, but I need something I can do. I will tell my people I will never, never watch you do a full H&P in the emergency department. I would rather die. It's just not my cup of tea. I'll, I'll tell him I'll go watch you do an interval history from a patient who's already been admitted but I'm just not going to go watch you do a full h and uh, My eyes will start to bleed. Um, so I'll redirect that. I'll say, this is how I'll see you do that. Um, and then making sure you observe at least those two things they're saying. And then you give feedback. And we've alluded to this. Um, feedback has, this is, these aren't formal official phrases, uh, but brief feedback is probably what I use more than ever. Um, this is that quick daily hit 
Um, I give feedback to everybody on my team at least once a day on rounds. And it's, they've just presented a patient. We're walking to the next room. I tap them on the shoulder. I say, step back, like we're a foot behind everybody else. And I go, okay, I love that you did that. That was really great because next time I want you to try this. And that's it. We don't have a long discussion. And they incorporate it in the next patient. It's fun to watch, right? So that brief feedback, if you're in clinic, right after you saw a patient, like, oh, you know, uh, you know, I love that you got a really good developmental history, but I also noticed that you like stood over the patient a lot. Maybe sit down next time. Quick, quick hit, right? It doesn't have the, the tell me your opinions. Let me know how you feel part. We'll get to that. But it's quick and they love it, right? Um, formal feedback is more of that sit down feedback, maybe at the end of a clinic day or after an event where you get that self-assessment. So how do you think that went? Where do you think we could have done differently? Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be in private. I know we talk about feedback in private, but I think if other people can learn from it and it's not particularly personal, it doesn't have to be. And then the major feedback, sometimes clerkship directors do this. Maybe this is what I do at the end of the week after I've had five days of watching. And then I can talk about trends in that one. Well, I love that you were really responsive every day to feedback. Um, you've gotten so much better at communicating with the families on rounds, but you're still using um, medical language, medical jargon. I'd love for you next week with the other attending work on that, right? So those are different levels. I would definitely try to focus on brief. Most, if you're only going to try one, learners want brief. I'll tell you that. Um, and to that, this is from an article, I think, from anesthesia. The thing I like the most is someone who just teaches you to go along rather than like waiting to the end of the day or waiting till your evaluation months later to tell about things that were done well and things that could be done better. I think it's just best to do it in real time, especially since the anesthesia is so hands-on because I want to be able to improve now than waiting a couple months. And while this talks about a couple months with that evaluation, we all know that nightmare evaluation that you get three months later and they mention something and you have no memory of what you did and you can't ask questions, that's the worst. But also even waiting at the end of a week or end of a two weeks or end of a month block, well, I could have been getting better for so much longer and you waited. So that more, again, if you have that culture, that culture of everything I'm saying is just to make you better, then it works, right? I actually made the mistake once of giving my talk at the beginning of the week and I said the whole thing, I'm gonna, and I say, every day you're gonna get something from me. Don't take it personally. It's just me trying to give you some quick feedback. But one of my students wasn't there because she was sick. She came on Wednesday and I was in the groove, right? It's day three, everybody's getting their feedback. We're all doing it. And I give it to her, but she didn't get the intro. And at the end of the round, she comes up to me and she's practically in tears and says, I know I'm doing horribly. I can just tell you I'm the only one you gave feedback to. I must be doing poorly. And I'm like, oh no. I was like, no. They, and she didn't notice I gave it to everybody else because she was too busy like spinning. But I realized I said, didn't set the expectation. And so she thought it was meant she was bad. So we also have to make sure the expectation is there. Then we have the more formal. This is the ask, tell, ask model. It's the new sandwich. Uh, so we ask them how they think they're doing with their goals or anything else. I tell how I think they went with their goals or anything else. And then together, first I ask for concordance. Does that seem valid to you? And now what can we do? And we work together on creating a plan to help them be better. Because without that plan, nothing's going to happen. Right. Because I've yet to meet a learner who's like, I can totally do all these things. And I thought this week I just would act like I couldn't. They don't know how to do it right. So coming up with a plan, whether that's with you and the seniors or however it works to help them improve. And we actually have online. Uh, I think we alluded to this feedback scripts um, that in those feedback scripts, it's templated on some standard issues that uh, trainees have and a script for how to say it, but also uh, possible plans for how to help them improve. Um, frame-based feedback, this is a different model. Describe how they're doing, diagnose their immediate needs and direct instruction to those needs. It's a little bit shorter. It doesn't necessarily have the, the self-assessment piece, but for the master adaptive learner, and if you've already set goals, I think it's easy to have the self-assessment piece. Um, and we talked about developing a plan using the learner goals. You've nailed this one. I think you've got that. Keep working on this one. What do you want to work on next? Make it a dialogue and again, the plan. So this is the coaching sequence. Again, identify yourself as a coach, however you want to do that. Help them articulate your goals. Ensure, this should be ensure opportunities for observation, frequent feedback, provide formal formative feedback and assist their MN plan. And, and some people are sitting in the audience right now, I'm guessing, oh yeah, but you're a hospitalist. You have them for a week. This works in anything. It's just shorter. If you have a day at clinic, you can start at the beginning of the day. What's the one thing you want to get out of clinic that you want to get better at in clinic today? 
And it takes you five minutes at the end of the day. You don't have to do a very long protracted feedback. You're in an ED shift. When you get on first thing, how long are you here? Well, my shift ends in six hours. Great, I have six hours with you. What one thing do you wanna work on, right? It can work in every setting and every duration. You just have to adjust for how much you think, is it an inch you can get them closer to the goal or is it a millimeter, right? Just pick that thing and you can still do all these things. It's just more compact. So does it work? We actually did a study that we haven't published because my partner who has all the data went into industry. Well, that's a bummer. Um, but we actually used a, a learning climate inventory. Um, so we assess the climate, so the culture in some ways. And then we um, survey learners about the climate, but we also surveyed the, um, them about which of these coaching behaviors our, our attendings use. And so on the left is the ECI score, the Educational Climate Inventory score. Um, and you can see for every one of our things that you did, the climate score went up. So if your coach, if your attending were do, was doing these things, educational climate was better. And that educational climate is an area of discovery for ease of making mistakes or a lot of parts to it. But it says like you're allowed to be that growth mindset. And so having these allowed that to happen more. It also gave better ratings to the attendings. And I know that's not why we do this, but we do get evaluations and we do need to get promoted. So you're far more likely to get an outstanding if you do these things. So that's another carrot there for you. Um, and a couple more things for coaches, right? So that's how we're going to help our learner. Like those are our strategies. But again, like I've said, we need to grow as well. And so the same system, reflective practice, asking for feedback and growth mindset apply to us. And so reflective practice really quickly, Donald Shun did the work and there's reflection in action and on action. In action is right now, I'm doing it. It's tough for me right now because there's a bunch of you in a room and I can't see you and everybody else has their, their um, uh, camera off. So I'm having trouble uh, getting a read. Heather, Heather has a great picture on her, uh, her screen though. And so every time I'm wondering if this is going well, I look at Heather's picture and I feel like it's going well. Um, thank you, Heather, for your picture. But I'm still trying to figure out, did people respond when I paused and asked for stuff? I'm trying to reflect in action what I would change. We all, that's something we should all be doing when we're teaching, when we're giving a lecture, when we're working on the clinical world, we should be aware, right? And then reflection on action is what I'll do after this. This is what I'll do at the next step and say, is there anything I would change? How would I, how would I shake that up for a virtual presentation? Whatever that is. So we should be doing that though clinically. So when we're done with a day of a uh, clinic or day of rounds or day of working, some period of working with a learner, we should be reflecting on, is there something I would do differently? Because we should all be looking for growth. We should be our own master adaptive learner. Same process, right? I, I, um, Years ago, before I knew Master Adaptive Learner, I had the most notable process of this, but the, um, the input, the identifying the gap came from an evaluation, two evaluations actually, two evaluations in a six month period, which you know means I got them six months later, said I was scary. My boss said, it's too scary, who cares? Don't worry about it. I said, no, I'm gonna fixate because that's what I do. And so I actually sat there and said, I don't know what they meant by scary. I don't know any of these things. So my way of finding resources and engaging and learning was I asked every team I was on with for 18 months. So I think it was like eight groups. I got these email for being scary. I don't know what they meant. If at any point during this week, you think I'm scary, stop rounds and let's talk about it. And it took 18 months. And finally, one student said, oh my gosh, that was it. And I go, what was it? And he was like, scary. I mean, I didn't think you were scary, but, but it could have been. And then I realized what it was is he said, you ask questions of us like on rounds and you, your brain works much faster than ours. And you already know the answer. And you're so excited to teach that you wait about two seconds and then you pounce and your energy can be very scary. It's not that you're mean. It's just very intimidating when you come in at it. And I'm like, oh, so then I spent months having my goal on rotation being to make sure I wasn't scary, but I used the other words. So then I engaged in my learning. I tried it out and I incorporated. Interestingly, a, about a year ago, I got feedback from someone on the same exact thing. But what was, so I must've fallen off the wagon a little bit. What was interesting is I'd now established my own way of approaching. So instead of putting in an ev evaluation that I wouldn't get for six months and wouldn't understand, it was an intern and she came to me directly and we had a long conversation and I'd only been on service for two days with her and it actually helped me. So it's that idea that we can also show that we are going through this process and people are gonna be more amenable to giving us feedback. So what does it take, right? It takes players, coaches, and the team. 
Players, self-assess, be open to the coaching, focus on personal growth, be a master adaptive learner. Coaches, use the coaching framework to help our master adaptive learners be that way and focus on growth. And then focus on your own personal growth. We can also role model how to be a master adaptive learner. And then the organization or the team needs to focus on the culture you are by having this talk, but it can't, it can't end here. It has to be a continual dialogue about how we want to do that. Do we want to use the evaluations differently? What expectation, right? Go back to that earlier slide. What expectation do we have as faculty of not only how often you give feedback, but how you do it? And prioritize and value it. There are ways to give credit for this kind of thing. Maybe if you get a lot of evaluations that say you're like the best at feedback, and it was a Dr. Jane, I couldn't quite hear. Like, give some kudos for that. I know we don't give money for anything, but give some kudos for that so that people see this as a value. So hopefully in this talk, you've heard one or two or three things you want to try differently. And my, um, my task to you, decide what that is, commit to doing it in the next week, and then focus on what you've done, and I think you'll succeed. So hopefully I've given you a, a lot to think about, but maybe there's one or two things you can take and apply now so that whether you're a teacher or a learner, because I don't know how many learners are in the room right now, I think um, hopefully we've all got something and we can build that culture where you are of feedback being about growth rather than being something to worry about. And that way we all come into feedback a little differently and it'll be far more successful. I am happy to answer any questions now. Thank you again for having me.